hoping to capture an image of themselves surrounded by a recognizable piece of quintessential New Orleans iconography. After the transatlantic slave trade was outlawed in 1808, about a million people were transported from the Upper South to the Lower South. More than 100,000 of them were brought down the Mississippi River and sold in New Orleans. Leon A. Waters came and stood next to me on the riverfront, hands in pockets, lips compressed, overlooking the Mississippi's slow bend between the two shores of the city. I had been introduced to Waters by a group of young black activists in New Orleans who were part of the organization Take Em Down NOLA, whose self-espoused mission is the removal of all symbols of white supremacy in New Orleans as part of a broader push for racial and economic justice. Waters has served as a mentor to many members of the group. They see him as an elder statesman of their movement and credit him for being a central part of their political education. Waters, in his late 60s, with a graying mustache sitting over his lips, wore a black sports coat with a gray and white striped shirt with the top button undone. A navy blue tie hung loosely below his unfastened collar and swung over the waistband of his faded blue jeans. A pair of thin frame rectangular shaped glasses sat high on the bridge of his nose, the left lens with a slight smudge in its bottom corner. His voice was low and unvarying in its tone. Waters might be mistaken for Surly, but his disposition is simply a reflection of the seriousness with which he takes the subject matter he is often discussing, the subject of slavery. We were standing in front of a plaque recently put up by the New Orleans Committee to Erect Markers on the Slave Trade, outlining Louisiana's relationship to the transatlantic slave trade. It's doing its job, Waters said of the plaque. All through the day, people come in, they stop, they read, take pictures. It's another way of educating people to this. In recent years, markers like this began to go up throughout the city, each documenting a specific area's relationship to enslavement, part of a broader reckoning. After years of black people being killed by police and having their deaths broadcast in videos streamed across the world, after a white supremacist went into a black church in Charleston, South Carolina, and killed nine people as they prayed, after neo-Nazis marched in Charlottesville, Virginia, to protect a Confederate statue and reclaim a history born of a lie, after George Floyd was killed by a police officer's knee on his neck, cities across the country have begun to more fully reckon with the history that made such moments possible. A history that many had previously been unwilling to acknowledge. Waters, who identifies as a local historian and revolutionary, was not new to this. He and others like him have for years been working to illuminate the city's legacy, and by extension the country's legacy, of oppression. Only recently, after decades of pushing by activists amid the larger groundswell of national pressure, have city officials begun to listen, or perhaps feel like they finally have the political capital to act. In 2017, New Orleans removed four statues and monuments that, it had determined, paid tribute to the legacy of white supremacy. The city removed memorials to Robert E. Lee, the general who led the Confederacy's most successful army during the Civil War, a slaveholder. Jefferson Davis, the first and only president of the Confederacy, a slaveholder. P.G.T. Beauregard, a general in the Confederate Army who ordered the first shots of the Civil War, a slaveholder. And a monument dedicated to the Battle of Liberty Place, an 1874 insurrection in which white supremacists attempted to overthrow the integrated Reconstruction-era state government of Louisiana. These monuments are gone now, but at least a hundred streets, statues, parks, and schools named after Confederate figures, slaveholders, and defenders of slavery remain. On a cool February afternoon, Waters, the founder of Hidden History Tours of New Orleans, promised to show me where some of these vestiges of the past remain. Waters drove me past two schools named after John McDonough, a wealthy slave-owning merchant after whom dozens of schools, filled largely with black children, were named until the 1990s. We drove past shops and restaurants and hotels where there had once been offices, showrooms, and slave pens of more than a dozen slave trading firms that made New Orleans the largest slave market in antebellum America. Like the Omni Royal Orleans Hotel, built on the site of the St. Louis Hotel, where men, women, and children were bought, sold, and separated from one another. We drove past Jackson Square, in the heart of the tourist-filled French Quarter, where rebellious enslaved people...